Good day, Grade Tens. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. In this lesson, we're going to carry on working through vectors and scalars, and then we're going to do some examples, and then we're going to talk about frames of reference and motion in 1D. Let's see how far we get, shall we? So we were speaking about scalars and vectors, and we spoke about the fact that everything we measure can be divided into two groups, right? Scalars and vectors. And I'm just reminding you of that because we got as far as looking at different ways of measuring our vectors. Now, do you remember that we spoke initially about measuring vectors in a single direction? And then we'd say we could either add them like this and like that. In other words, if we had an eight and a four, both going in the same direction, we would add them like this, and then they'd end up having a resultant vector of 12. However, if, for example, we have someone walking six kilometers this way, and then they walk three kilometers back, then because they are vectors, they're actually walking three direct kilometers in the opposite direction. And as soon as you have an opposite direction, you have to put a minus. And then when you work out the resultant, remember the resultant is the sum of all the vectors. This is going to be displacement resultant would be six plus minus three, because it's in the opposite direction, which equals three kilometers. So therefore the result in displacement would be three kilometers from where you started. Okay, that makes sense. Hey? But now, now what we're looking at is the fact that we can not necessarily move in a single direction. For example, you might have someone that walks um, length of the field, let's make that, I don't know how far that is. So let's say that that is 50 meters and then they walk another 40 meters, okay? And we want to know what is the resultant. So what we can do is we can say, first of all, how big is that resultant? How far are they from where they started? And that's pretty easy to work out because we can use, like I said, because we're doing right angles, we can work out Pythagoras. So we could say that R is equal to the square root of the first direction, which is 50, all squared, plus that direction there, which is 40, all squared. And then what we do is we get out our calculator and we just close this. Sorry about that. Okay, and we clear and we say that we have got the square root of 50 squared plus 40 squared equals and then it becomes 64.03. So the magnitude of the resultant, the magnitude is 64.03 meters. But we now need to find the size of the angle. Okay, in other words, we need to know that direction from north or we can work out the bearing, okay? The reason for this is imagine if this was kilometers. Imagine this was 50 kilometers and this is 40 kilometers. Okay, and imagine you say, oh my word, I've been hiking up in the mountains and I have broken my leg and I need someone to come and save me. And they say to you, how far are you from where you started? And you say, well, I'm 64,03 kilometers away from where I started. And then they will say that doesn't really help because let's pretend that your start of your hike is over here. Just saying you're 64.03 kilometers away, that means that they have to cover the area of the circle. And let's just work out what that is. The area of a circle is pi r squared, which we put pi times the 64, let's just make it 64 squared, kilometers squared. So let's work out what that is. So that's 64.03 squared equals 
multiplied by pi, if I can find it, I can never find it in this calculator. There it is, shift pi equals, that doesn't help, 12,880.53 square kilometers. Okay, that's 12,880.53 square kilometers. That is a huge area to try and cover to find out where the person might be if they got lost or hurt, okay? And that's one of the reasons why a vector and the um, the direction is so important because if we can give them this angle from north, then they will fly only in that direction and they will find you pretty easily. Okay, fair enough. Right, now let's work out how we would work that angle out. So always try and work out the stuff that you had first. Okay, so we were given 50 and we we're given 40. So let's use that in our equation to find our direction. So we were given that this is 50 and we were given that this is 40. And we want to know what is our angle. Okay, alpha. So do you agree we can use Sakatoa because we've been told that this is a right angle? So this is Sakatoa. We've got the opposite side and we've got the adjacent side. So we're definitely using tan. So we can say tan of alpha is equal to opposite over adjacent. So it's going to be 40 over 50, these cancel. So therefore we've got that alpha is equal to second function tan of four over five. Okay, so that's cool. So now what we can do is we can actually then, ooh, what happened? Hand a second. Oh, there we are, we're back. We can use our calculator. Um, add a minute. There we go. There we go. And we can go shift tan of four over five close bracket equals thirty eight point six six degrees. So that's thirty eight comma six six degrees. So I would say this is on a bearing of thirty eight comma six six degrees. Or you could say it's thirty eight point sixty six degrees east of north. Right, now let's talk about frames of reference because frames of reference are very, very, very important, okay? And it helps us to understand velocity and speed and all those things. So, observations and measurements can only be made from a certain point. Okay, in other words, when you are watching something, you are looking at something from a certain frame of reference. You are noticing something from a specific point of view, okay? The frame of reference is often the starting point or the point of origin and therefore is given the value zero. The motion of the object is expressed relative to something else, i.e. the surface or another object. And that is called the frame of reference, okay? So if you are mentioning um, something, you mention the motion with respect to something else, then what you are doing is you're actually giving it a frame of reference. For example, if you're sitting in the seat of a sports car, you are stationary relative to the car, even though you may be moving, 100 kilometers per hour relative to the road. So with respect to the road, you are moving at 100 kilometers an hour, but with respect to the car, you are not moving at all. And this is similar to thinking about what we are doing as we sit at our desk now watching this video or talking about it, okay? So for example, I'm sitting in my chair in front of the desk 
and I'm currently stationary. So I'm stationary with respect to the desk and with respect to the floor and with respect to the ground, okay? But I'm not stationary with respect to space, okay? Because first of all, the Earth is rotating on its own axis, okay, at a rate such that we have a full day in 24 hours. Okay, do you understand that? So you need to be aware of the fact that even though we are standing stationary on Earth, Earth is moving with respect to the stars and the sun, etc., etc. So let's look at this little video that I've got here. We've got two cars, okay? This is scene one and this is scene two, and this is car A and this is car B. I want to see if you can tell me which one is this, one where car A is moving away and one where car B is moving. And I want you to work out for me which one is which, okay? So let's have a look at it. So do you see that without any frame of reference, we can't tell whether car A is moving or whether car B is moving, okay? Because of the fact that there is no frame of reference. So if you look over here, we can see that car A is definitely getting smaller, but we don't know if it's because car A is moving forward or if in fact our car B, the one that we're in, is moving backwards. Okay, we can't tell. But what we can do is we use a frame of reference like a tree. Okay, so now let's have a look at the video. So here's car A in front of the tree both times. Do you see that on the left hand side the car is moving to be in front of the tree? Let's play it again. Just look at the left hand side, scene one at the moment. Do you see that at the moment the car is behind the tree and then the car moves to in front of the tree? So the car in scene one, car A in scene one is moving forward. Now let's look at car B in scene two, car A in scene two. Here you can see that this is still going away, but it's very obvious that it's us that's moving, it's car B that's moving, and then car A remains stationary, remains stationary. Okay, and it's pretty obvious at this point because here is the shadow of the tree behind car A, where you see how the shadow is in front of car A. So do you see from that, we can not we can tell if we have a point of reference whether it is car A that is moving away or car B that is moving away. So now we can use this and our vectors to work out some questions looking at distance and displacement and all that type of thing. Some of the stuff is pretty obvious and we've done it already and some of it not so much. So we're going to go through it nice and slowly. Okay. So it says, John walks east. I'm just trying to find my pen. Sorry. John walks five kilometers east. So we're going to say to the right is east. Okay. John, he walks five kilometers east. Okay. Stops for rest and then walks a further seven kilometers east. Seven kilometers east. He realizes he dropped his water bucket bottle and retraces his step for two kilometers until he finds it. Okay, it says what is the distance traveled and then what is the displacement? Now you must remember that the distance traveled is a total distance that is covered by the person. Okay, the total distance. So if you look at this, you can see the total distance is going to be five kilometers plus the seven, plus the two. Because think about it, he traveled five kilometers, had a little break, then he traveled another seven kilometers, had a little break, realized that he dust his water bottle, and then he went back two kilometers. The actual distance he's traveled is 14 kilometers. Okay, now, now they say, 
what is his displacement? I remember the displacement is actually how far away is from where he started. So it's this distance here. This is his result or his actual displacement. Okay. So do you agree that we could say, well, in that case, if we choose easterly as positive, then do you agree that a westerly is going to be negative? Okay, that's a negative. Let me just rewrite it. Negative. Okay, so if that's the case, do you agree that we can remember that what is the rule for resultant? A resultant is just the sum of all the vectors added together. So the resultant is the sum of all the vectors added together. So in this case, the resultant displacement is going to be the 5 plus the 7, because they're still going in the positive direction, plus minus 2, because it's going in the opposite direction, okay? I know it's the same subtraction, but you need to show that you understand that this is the vector sum of all the, that this, it's the vector sum of all the vectors, and also that m this is minus 2, because it's in the opposite direction. So 5 plus 7 is 12, minus 2 is 10. So the total distance is 10 kilometers, well, the displacement is 10 kilometers, and then we haven't finished, it's asking displacement, and displacement is a vector, so if it's this 10 kilometers east, 10 kilometers east. Right. Okay. Now let's talk about average speed versus average velocity. We've kind of spoken about this already, but now we're going to get very specific, okay? So we said that distance was a total distance the person traveled, okay? In other words, it doesn't matter if they go at uphill, downhill, back to where they started, past that point, whatever, the distance is the total distance he's traveled. That is equal to the total distance, the speed is equal to the total distance divided by the total time. The total distance divided by the total time. And it is a scalar because distance is a scalar. However, average velocity is a total displacement. Displacement, my apologies for Tapo. It is the total displacement divided by the total time. And that is obviously a vector which has got magnitude and direction. So now let's look at a different type of example. We're going to do the same thing, but this time he, we're going to work out his speed and his velocity. Okay, right. So let's do that. We've got John walks five kilometers east stops to race for a while and then walks a further seven kilometers east. He realizes that he's dropped his water bottle and retraces his steps for two kilometers and finds it. He walked a total of three hours. What is its average speed? Now remember that for one, it is the total distance divided by the total time. The total distance divided by the total time. Okay, so if that's the case, the total distance, like we said, he walked five kilometers and then seven kilometers and then went back two kilometers, then that is definitely 14 kilometers. Five plus seven is 12 plus two is 14. So he traveled 14 kilometers, but he did it in a total of three hours. We get to divide by three. So 14 divided by three is going to be 3 and 2 thirds, it's 3 comma 6, no it's not, it's 4, it's 4 comma 6, 7. It's equal to 4 comma 6, 7 kilometers per hour, kilometers per hour. That is the total distance over the total time. Now they want the average velocity. Now remember that the average velocity is the total displacement over the total time. Okay, so now again, 
We know he traveled five kilometers. Let's do it again. Let's just make it neater. So for number two, we've got this traveled five and then he traveled seven and then he went back two. So his total displacement was actually 12, right? His total displacement is 12. Therefore, velocity is equal to displacement, the total displacement, which is 12, over the velocity of 3, which is going to be naught comma, actually it's not, it's going to be 4. <sighs> four meters per second and then in what direction well how far is he from where he started he's east and he's 12 meters east it's 12 meters east there you go quite a nice question here good intro just to get you into understanding velocities and um, vectors and scalars and distances and displacements Okay, so we've done all that. Now let's talk about the conversions in one motion 1D. Guys, the conversions are incredibly important because you have to remember to write everything in your SI units. If you don't write in the SI units, you're going to get it all wrong, which will be very, very tragic. So we need to make sure that you do not do that. So, um, Distance and displacement are measured in meters, not kilometers, not miles, not feet. It is in meters, okay? Time in science is measured in seconds, seconds, okay? Now, what's important about this is that the letter, the letter given for meters is obviously M. The letter given for seconds is S, okay? It's not, and I repeat this several times, it is not sex, okay? Not sex, it is seconds or just S. So therefore, velocity is going to be meters per second and distance is going to be meters per second. You just need to remember to always use a direction as well with your velocity. So let's have another example. It says, Sarah walked two kilometers away from her home in 30 minutes. She then turns around and walks back along the same path, also in 30 minutes. It says, what is average, see Sarah's average speed? So if you think about it, Sarah walked two kilometers, which is 2,000 meters that way. And then she walked 2,000 meters back, okay? So do you agree that her distance, this question one, her distance is going to be 2,000 meters, right? Now, the time, we need to put this in SA units, and we've got 30 minutes. So how do we change minutes to kilometers? Well, it's very easy. We multiply by 60. So we've got 30 times by 60, you've got 0, 0, and 6 threes are 18. So therefore, time is 1,800 seconds. Okay. Um, okay, so therefore we can say that the speed equals, now remember they've said that she walked there and she walked back. So her total distance um, is going to be 4,000 meters. That's 40,000 sound a second. You raise. Oh, so total distance is 4,000 meters. And her total time is 30 seconds, 30 minutes times by 60, which is going to be 1,800 seconds. But now remember that we've got two of them it's on the way there and on the way back so it's times by two which is going to be zero zero um and then we've got two times 18 which is 90 no 26 26 36 oh my word 36 so therefore 4000 divided by 3600 those two zeros cancel and divide both the top and the bottom by four. You get 10 over nine. And then we go get our calculator and we go 10 divided by nine and we get uh, SD, SD, 
1.11, we get 1,11 meters per second. And please note I am using SI units. Now let's talk about our average velocity. Remember that velocity is a total distance or total displacement over total time. But Sarah walked two kilometers away from home, right? And then she walked two kilometers back. So what is her displacement? How far is he, she from where she started? Well, can you see her displacement is zero? Because she walked away two kilometers, but then she walked back two kilometers. So therefore her displacement is zero and therefore her average velocity will also be a big fat zero. Right, let's carry on. Now, uh, I've done all this. Now let's talk about acceleration. Okay, so average acceleration is defined as the rate of change of velocity. Now let's think about that. If that's the case, so average acceleration is basically the change in velocity divided by the time taken. Okay, the change in velocity Wait, before I show you that, the change in velocity, so it's delta V, acceleration, is delta V over delta T, right. But now what is velocity? Is velocity a vector or scalar? Well, it's pretty obvious that velocity is a vector. So for that reason, we can see that, um, hang on, so there we've got that this then is a vector, right? Time is a scalar, because as far as we're concerned, even though there's Doctor Who and all sorts of things, we cannot travel back in time. Therefore, what is a vector divided by scalar? Well, it's obviously a vector. So therefore, your acceleration is a vector as well, and therefore has to have magnitude and direction. Has to have magnitude and direction. Okay. So let's look at this motorcyclist. Okay, can you see that what is happening is he's accelerating from rest. Okay, this is the time in seconds. So we've got, he is at this point, hang on, at this point at zero time. He's at this point at two seconds, this point at four seconds, and this point at six seconds. So his velocity is increasing as well. It's going from year to year, it's going up. His velocity speed is now four meters per second. His velocity here is eight meters per second. And the velocity there is 12 meters per second. And you might be wondering why I'm not writing the direction since I said that velocity is a vector. Well, it's all in the same direction. So it seems kind of silly to be writing it over and over again. Okay, but now look at the displacement. Do you see? The displacement, how far he travels in that amount of time, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So he's obviously accelerating because from year to year, he's only traveling four meters during those two seconds. But yeah, he's traveling 12 meters during two seconds. And yeah, he's traveling, what is that? That's 20 meters during those two seconds. So do you see he's traveling further and further and further in the same amount of time? So obviously he's going faster and faster and faster, right? And that's what acceleration is. Acceleration is when you cover more and more distance in the same amount of time. Okay, so you can see that the biker velocity is increasing by four meters per second and the reason the velocity is increasing by four meters per second is because the displacement is increasing as well. So the definition of acceleration is change in velocity over change in time like we said and since velocity is a vector and time is a scalar the acceleration is going to be vector divided by scalar which is a vector so if you go back here we could see that the velocity was changing yeah you had to plus four yeah you had to plus four and yeah you had to plus four so do you see that we've got a change in velocity of four meters per second for every two seconds so it's going up by four meters per second every two seconds okay 
therefore the acceleration is 2 meters per second squared. Okay. Now let's talk about positive and negative acceleration because this is actually a very important concept. Okay, um, acceleration is a vector. So positive and negative signs show us, indicate direction. You guys know this. So if I were to positive, if I say to you, I was traveling at six meters per second and then I changed and I was traveling at minus two. You guys, as far as you're concerned, means that you're now traveling in the opposite direction at two meters per second. Okay. So if I say to you have an acceleration of six meters per second squared, we think of it as the velocity is increasing in the positive direction, right? Okay, an acceleration of minus four means the velocity is increasing in the negative or opposite direction. Now deceleration, deceleration is considered to be the slowing down. Now it's quite weird because the government is kind of keeps changing their minds about this, but this is apparently going to stick. Because a couple of years ago when they spoke about deceleration, we weren't allowed to say it. You had to say negative acceleration or just positive acceleration. Now they say positive and negative acceleration describes speeding up and I mean describes the direction. So minus six means is a negative acceleration tells you that you're going the opposite direction. Deceleration means that you're slowing down but here's the problem. Even though deceleration means the velocity of the object is decreasing the object moves forward, it looks the same. If I say to your cyclist brakes and decelerates at minus three meters per second squared, then you know it's slowing down in the same direction at minus three meters per second squared. But if I say the cyclist now moves at minus three meters per second squared, you don't know if he is traveling in the same direction and slowing down or if he is traveling at three meters per second squared in the opposite direction. You don't know that, okay? So you can see that it actually is a little bit ambiguous at minus. It can either mean that it's slowing down in the same direction or that it's speeding up in the opposite direction, speeding up in the opposite direction. So at the moment, from our, what we've said, the context that we've got over here, let's see this, hang on. What this means is the cyclist velocity is decreasing in this forward direction. So you're traveling in the same direction, okay? You're traveling in the same direction, but um, you are slowing down. Okay, moving on. Okay. Oh, and that's the end for today. Okay, I think I moved through that a lot faster than I expected to. We will leave it for today and we will carry on on, what is today? Today, Thursday, on Tuesday with the next part of this lesson. Have a great day.